When you find thankful, you will personally begin a transformation on the inside of you. It just has that kind of power. When you find thankful, you will have a power that suddenly your trials of life begin to shrink and you begin to rise above them. When you find thankful, the presence of God's triumph gets bigger and bigger in your life. I am thankful for you being here this morning, and I'm also thankful to, uh, to the grace of God in my life. Can I tell you that we have our youth pastor is away today on a, uh, a retreat. Got 25 plus young people with him. Pastor Gary, our pastoral care pastor, is over in Sulphur and he's helping out one of our sister churches that needed somebody to preach for them today. They're getting a new pastor, but Pastor Gary's filling in. Pastor Sullivan is away on a much deserved uh, vacation this week. And next Sunday, we'll have all them backsliders back with us. I want you to know that. But we are thankful that you are here today. So you got to choose to be thankful. you got to stop looking at and counting up what you don't have and begin to look at all you do have and raise your eyes to heaven and say, thank you, Lord. Amen. Choosing to be thankful. In other words, don't let the trials of life make you grow calloused of heart. Don't let the difficult people of life make you angry or bitter towards everybody and everything. Don't let the negative emotions of life make you indifferent and incaring. Don't let all the blessings of your life go unnoticed or make you over familiar with the goodness of God. But you got to take some time and you got to set your mind and choose by your will to look up and say, I thank you, Lord. I give you praise, I give you honor, I give you glory for all you've done in my life. In everything, I'm going to give you thanks. Refuse to let grumbling and griping and complaining dominate you. Don't side with criticism and cynicalism in the multitude. Don't let it take over your life. But discover the power of a grateful life. Being thankful will empower you and move you from discouragement into having a winning mindset. It brings you out of victimhood into the victor's platform. You see, somebody said there's three possible attitudes when it comes to thanksgiving. First, some people think giving thanks is unnecessary. We find that in Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. It's a story about a very rich and successful man. We're not told that he was immoral or illegal. We're not told anything about him other than he was very successful. In fact, everything he set his hand to really prospered, and he had so much of a harvest, he said, what am I going to do? And he said, I'm go I know I'm going to tear down these little barns and build bigger barns. And when the bigger barns were filled up, he said, now I can push back, take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Eleven times in that story is the personal pronoun, I or mine. But then Jesus said that night, God said to that man, you fool. This night your soul is required of thee. In other words, there's some people that are blessed in life, they prosper in life, and they really don't think it's necessary to stop and to say, thank you, Lord. But then there are some people who just pretend to be thankful. They are like the self-righteous Pharisee who, that Jesus spoke in a parable when he went into prayer and he said, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. His prayer is really to himself and about himself. But then thirdly, there are people who really know if it had not been for the Lord on their side. There are people who from their heart of hearts know that God has been good to them. You see, gratitude is being thankful for what you do have rather than being upset about what you don't have. The secret of living a life full of thanksgiving is realizing what you have and who you are in Christ. Can I go on the official record by saying this morning, I am thankful that I have in Christ a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that guards my heart and my mind, a peace this world didn't give me and this world can't take it away. In Christ, I'm thankful today that I got a joy. It's unspeakable, and it's full of glory. It's become the strength of my life. It's like medicine to my body. 
I'm thankful that I have an assurance of his presence. For the Lord himself has said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. Therefore, I can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what man shall do unto me. I'm thankful that I have a blessed hope. And as this world waxes darker and darker, my hope burns brighter and brighter. We're told in the last days many things are going to happen, but we're never encouraged to find a cave and to go into it and to hope for the best. No, the Bible says, look up, your redemption drawing nigh, because there's a king that's coming who's going to set all things right. Can somebody give him praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So be thankful for what you have, and you'll end up having more. You see, if you concentrate on what you don't have, you'll never, ever have enough. Someone wrote, if a fellow isn't thankful for what he's got, he isn't likely to be thankful for what he's going to get. You see, a grateful heart releases something supernatural. It restores a right relationship with God. Because if you don't have gratitude in your heart today, can I just tell you scripturally, you're not right with God. For all that he created, we need to be thankful unto him. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. A grateful heart will keep you from being taken captive by circumstances that we'll all go through. A grateful heart will keep you in the will of God. It will help to activate God's plan for your life. You see, I'm trying to say thankfulness should be the hallmark of a Christian. The lack of thankfulness shows a heart in need of mending instruction and direction. Paul, the apostle, put it simply like this. It is the will of God for you to be thankful. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. If you're not very thankful or if gratitude is not really in your heart, you are drifting further and further from the will of God and a certain frustration begins to take over your life. For we are all created by God to do his will and his will is that we live thankful lives. 2 Timothy 3, 2, in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. And then it says ungrateful. Romans chapter one and verse 20, it says the more ungrateful we become, the darker our life gets. You begin to sink spiritually and submerge into the trials and troubles and the testings of life. There's one power, however, that can lift you up. And that's the power to say, I don't care what I'm going through or how night, dark the night is. I believe that joy is gonna come in the morning and my God can make a way where there is no way. Hallelujah. You see, it's through having a heart of gratitude and finding thankful that you really begin to discover the power of a redeemed life. A thankful heart is a right heart. A thankful heart is a healthy heart. In fact, I want to encourage you all week long to say, just stop and say, thank you, Lord. I want to encourage you to say it every hour of every day for this entire week. I mean, it'd be kind of hard when you're sleeping to say it, but... Say enough that it covers your sleep pattern, amen? Hey, would you say it with me right now? Just, just right now, would you look up and say, thank you, Lord? Come on, say it again, thank you, Lord. Say it again, thank you, Lord. Would you stand to your feet and say, thank you, Lord? Come on, come on, give him some thanks. Thank him right now, thank him. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Jonah was running from God. He got on a, on a ship headed for Tarshish. The word Tarshish in the Hebrew means hard. Life is hard when you run from God. He found himself in a difficult storm, rejected and perplexed. Jonah's life got darker and darker until in the belly of a great fish, the Bible says, he offered God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And it brought a great release. God was moved by his sacrifice of thanksgiving, and he gave Jonah a second chance. I don't know about you, but I've needed a lot of second chances in my life. And it brought a national revival to a country that was under the judgment of God. If your life has been one storm after another lately, 
If you felt neglected and rejected, if you feel like you're being swallowed up by dark circumstance, friends, it's time to graduate from Whale University. The book of Jonah, chapter 2, I'm reading from the living paraphrase, from the belly of that great fish, the words of Jonah read, when I had lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord, and my earnest prayer went to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods have turned their backs on all the mercies waiting for them from the Lord. I will never worship anyone but you, for how can I thank you enough for all you have done? I will surely fulfill my promises, for my deliverance comes from the Lord alone. And the Lord ordered the fish to spit up Jonah on the beach, and it did it. Hallelujah. The book of Jonah is 48 verses. It's four chapters. In fact, it's 1,328 English words. But perhaps there's not a portion of Scripture that has received more ridicule and scorn and disbelief than this book of Jonah. In fact, I remember reading a story about a little girl who was talking to her teacher about whales. And the teacher said that it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human being because though it was, had a very large mammal, its throat was very small. The little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Irritated, the teacher reiterated that a whale could not swallow a human. It was physically impossible. And the little girl said, when I go to heaven, I will ask Jonah. And the teacher said, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? She said, then you ask him. I love the story of the Sunday school class when the teacher taught on the book of Jonah and they said, okay, everybody, what did we learn about Jonah and the big fish? A bright-eyed little eight-year-old girl said, always travel by air. <laughs> could it have happened for real? It could if you understand a few things. The Mediterranean Sea that Jonah was swallowed in, it is home to a couple of species of very large fish. The Mediterranean covers an area of 965, 300 square miles. That is 2.5 million kilometers. It's an average depth of 4,900 feet, an average depth. At its deepest point, it is 17,280 feet. It has been estimated that the Mediterranean is large enough to contain over 185 double-decker buses, so it's big enough and deep enough to contain a big fish, big enough to swallow a person and for them to live in it for three days. How did Jonah survive three days and three nights in the digestive system of a large fish? G.W. Kellogg, in his book, The Bible Today, wrote, Quote, there are at least two known fish of the deep that could easily have swallowed Jonah. They are the sulfur bottom whale and the whale shark. Neither has any teeth. They open their enormous jaws and they take in water at an incredible speed. Then they strain out the water and they swallow what is left. In 1933, a sulfur bottom whale was captured off the coast of Cape Cod. It was 100 feet long with a mouth 10 to 12 feet wide. These whales, interestingly enough, have four to six compartments in their stomachs and in any one of which a colony of men could find free lodging. They might even have a choice of rooms for in the head of the whale is a wonderful air storage chamber, an enlargement of the nasal passage, an opening that measures seven feet by 14 foot. If the whale has an unwelcome guest on board who gives him a headache, the whale swims to the nearest land and gets rid of the offender as he did Jonah. The Bible says when God came to Jonah and gave him a call to go to Nineveh, Jonah looked up at God and said, I'm not going. Now when Isaiah got a call, he said, here am I, Lord, send me. When Jonah got a call, he said, here am I, but I'm not going. He goes down to Joppa and he finds out there's a ship going to Tarshish. 
Now, Nineveh was about 500 miles east of Jonah when the call came. But he gets on a ship headed for Tarshish, which is modern-day Spain, and that's 2,500 miles due west. And so Jonah decides that he is going to go in opposite direction of the call that God put on his life. How many of you know when you run from God, it makes a hard life? But can I say there is a call of God on every single one of you this morning? There is a design, a purpose, and a plan, and God has called you for a particular and to a specific assignment. Why would Jonah look straight into the face of God and say, no, I'm not going to Nineveh? Well, history and archaeology might help us a little bit because the documents that have been discovered tell us how vicious the people of Nineveh really were. It is modern-day Iraq, or Mosul, if you would. It was a savage city. And consider one Assyrian king, what it has written in history on documents discovered by archaeologists about their defeated foes. Quote, 3,000 captives I burned with fire. Their corpses I formed into pillars. Their governor I filleted his skin. I spread out upon the wall of the city. From some I cut off their hands and their fingers and their noses. Uh, of many I put out their eyes. I formed a pillar of heads against the city gate, or skulls, I should say, and 700 men I impaled up on stakes. Now let me ask you a question. Would you want to go there? Not exactly a vacation spot for Jonah. Jonah got on the ship headed the exact opposite place. But if you think that Jonah is just about a fish story, you got to think again, because the big message of Jonah is that there is a God in heaven who is absolute sovereign. He controls everything and everyone. The big message of Jonah is that this sovereign God is merciful. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jonah gets on the ship and they hit bad water. The Bible says the Lord brought a wind on. God caused a storm. How many of you know God can cause a fix to fix you? A great storm came up. They're all calling out to their gods. They notice everybody's on deck calling out to God. They're throwing their supplies over to lighten the ship so it wouldn't break apart. And they notice that there's one person missing. The captain goes down and he slams on Jonah's cabin door. Jonah comes to the door and says, what's up? He said, you, why are you sleeping when the rest of us are drowning? He drags Jonah up to the bow of ship. And all the men said, who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? And who is your God? He said, I am a Hebrew. I'm from the land of the Hebrews. And my God is Jehovah, the creator of the land and the sea. And Jonah said, I know that I have caused this trouble. What are we going to do? They took straws and they pulled and Jonah, sure enough, drew the short one. And so they looked at Jonah, and Jonah says, look, if you will just throw me overboard, everything will be all right. The men looked at him, and then they began to cry out, and they said, God of, uh, of the Hebrews, we don't want to take innocent blood, and nor do we want to be guilty of the blood of this man. They tried to row back to shore. It wouldn't work. And finally, they came to grips. They must throw Jonah overboard. And when they threw Jonah overboard, the Bible says the wind stopped. God controls the storm. God can make the storm stop. Somebody's been going through some stormy weather here lately. Somebody's in a dark of a night. Somebody is going through some very difficult moments in your life. The God who can bring those things to pass is the same God who can stop it, and he can do it in a moment's time. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Just begin to realize he is sovereign God. Sovereignty. It means that he is God and God alone. And the outworking of divine sovereignty is that God can do what he pleases and that he will take no, not no for an answer. Sovereignty. God is sovereign. Over what, pastor? He's sovereign over the earth. From the history of creation and all through eternity, 
over every continent, over every ocean, over every great lake. He is Lord of the mountains. He's Lord of the valleys. He's sovereign over every animal, every animal, a sea fish. He's uh, over any animal on the land and in the area. He is sovereign over every nation and state, parish and county, individual, a race, a tribe, every people group on planet earth, every city and every rule committee. God is sovereign and he rules and he reigns. Hallelujah. God has said to Jonah, you got to go to Nineveh because their wickedness has come up to me in heaven. And if they do not repent, I will have to severely judge them. Now, here's the thing. Jonah is thrown into the ocean. The storm stops immediately. How else would his life have been preserved out in the middle of the ocean? I mean, no, God can use all his creation to bring rescue to his own. This passage is validated by the highest authority. When you turn to Matthew's gospel, chapter 38, some of the scribes and Pharisees answered Jesus and said, we want to see a sign from you. But Jesus said in verse 39, he answered them and said, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So here is the Son of God, and he's making reference to Jonah the prophet. He continues, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall stand up with this generation at the judgment and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, some, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus validates the historicity, the reality of the Jonah experiment. The Bible says when Jonah was spit up upon the shore, he goes to Nineveh and I'm telling you, as an evangelist, he really had a short message. You got 40 days to turn back to God. That's all he said. It took him three days to walk through the city, and every time a big crowd, you got 40 days to turn back to God. But you know, when you do what God calls you to do, it's not up to you, it's up to the move of the mighty hand of God. And what happened is that when people heard it, the mercy of God began to prick their hearts. The Bible says that people began to cry out. They began to realize that they had been doing wrong, that their wickedness had come to bear and God was holding them accountable. They put on sackcloth. They put on ashes. They began to, to have a fast in the city. In fact, the Bible says that when word got to the king of Nineveh, he himself got off of the throne on his knees and he cried out to God. How many believes that America could have such a visitation from the White House to the country roads of this nation? God could show up and we could have an outpouring, a revival in this nation. Come on and give me some praise. Hallelujah. The scripture says the king himself took off his robe. He put on sackcloth. He sat on an ash heap or really a dirt mound and they repented. And the Bible says for 40 days they fasted. They didn't even feed the animals. And God took notice and he relented of his judgment to come upon Nineveh. Now, I don't know about you, but I, if I was a visiting evangelist and a whole city repented and came to God, I would be happy, but Jonah got mad. He said, God, I knew this would happen. I said, exactly why I didn't want to come. I know you're sovereign and you are merciful, and I just knew you were going to spare this people, and I am mad. So he walks through the city, and he's not willing to leave the area. He's looking down at the city from the outside and he's just waiting for judgment to fall. 
It's hot. And the Bible says God made a strong east wind, a scorching wind. And he began to suffer great heat. He felt as though he was dying from a heat stroke. And so he begins to cry out. The Lord made a plant grow. This is all in the book of Jonah. And this plant that grew had very large leaves. And there Jonah was covered by the leaves. And he was happy again. And he waited. And then God sent a worm and it ate the plant. <laughs> you know, somewhere along the line, you just got to come to grips with God's the boss. And God wants everybody to get saved. Not just you and your clan. Come on. And so Jonah is mad that the plant dies. And so God says, what right do you have to be mad that the plant dies? You even had compassion. You were happy the plant was there. But did you plant the plant? Did you cultivate the plant? Did you water this plant? Did you cause it to grow overnight like I did? Listen, I'm trying to communicate. Help me, Holy Spirit. There is a God who can turn your world upside down. He can move in the sea and on the land in the midst of the storm. He is sovereign. He is Lord of lords and the King of kings. And he's waiting for you to look up and say, thank you. Hallelujah. The Bible says that Jonah finally realized that it was God's mercy and God's sovereignty that was going to have the last word. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm trying to say life's not easy. Everyone faces challenges. Everybody has trials and testings. Heartache and lonely times, disappointments. But true thanksgiving supersedes our circumstance. We can be thankful, as the Apostle Paul said, for what he's already done and brought us through. We can be thankful that he's with us right here and right now. We can be thankful that no matter what comes against us for evil, God can turn it around for good. We can be thankful that God himself is at work in all things for our good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. You see, God doesn't cause the hard times in our lives, but through his sovereignty, he can use them and build character and reposition us. What are the lessons from Jonah? When you find thankful. God makes a way. He is sovereign. He's Lord of all mankind, and everyone is accountable to him. God is mighty, but he's also merciful. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And without God's mercy, none of us are going to be able to stand on the last day. If you are thankful for the mercy of God in your life, would you just slip up your hand and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When I didn't deserve it, when what I had coming didn't come, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. The message of Jonah is that people can change. And God wants all to have the opportunity to change. Jonah's a lot like you and I. He found thankful he was delivered. He found the supernatural destiny God had for him. His name has gone down history. You may not realize this, but there's 50,000 Americans named Jonah. You may not know this, but the Apostle Peter he was the, called Simon Bar-Jonah, or the son of Jonah. Peter's father was named Jonah. The message of Jonah is that you find thankful, but you got to keep finding it, and keep finding it, and keep finding it. And you know what I have found through the years? That if we could get a lot of folk just to mind their own business? Oh, you don't want to hear that. If 
if you just focus on you and God and keep thankful, God can make a way for you. A surgeon who was renowned and well-known but not very liked. He was successful but very arrogant. He was blunt and he was insensitive to all of his patients. People endured that because he was one of the best. They brought to him a case of an eight-year-old boy who was dying with a heart defect. In his arrogance, he accepted the case because he thought, he could do something that no one else could do. He stopped by the boy's room the night before the surgery. And he said, son, tomorrow morning, I'll be opening up your heart. The little boy said, you'll find Jesus there. The surgeon continued, I'll, I'll open your heart and I'll check the damage. You'll find Jesus there, the boy said. When I see the damage, I'll suture you back up and then think about the next step. You'll find Jesus in my heart because my Sunday school teacher told me. She said it's so in the Bible. And we sing that he lives in my heart. I know he's there, said the boy. The surgeon looked, walked out. The surgery took place the next day. And after the surgery, the, the great surgeon began to make notes of what he found. In his mind, there was no hope. There was no cure. He couldn't fix the little boy. The little boy would die within a matter of months. The surgeon thought and he began to reminisce why this would happen. And so he leaned back in his chair and he shouted out loud, God, why did you let this happen to this little boy? Why can't he live a normal life? And then when he stopped speaking, God spoke to the surgeon. God said, the boy is a part of my flock and will always be part of my flock. When he is with me, there will be no more suffering and pain. He will have comfort and peace. One day his parents, as well as you, will join him and my flock will continue to grow. The next day, the surgeon went to the little boy's room and he sat down with the parents beside the bed. In a moment or two, the boy opened his eyes and he asked quietly, what did you find in my heart? And with tears pouring down his cheeks, the surgeon said, I found Jesus there. What would we find in your heart today? See, it's... It's not how materially successful, it's not how you look, it's not your house or the car you drive. It's not the titles behind your name. To God, only one thing matters, your heart. What would we find in your heart? Would he find Jesus there? Would others find Jesus in your heart? You see, God sent a great fish to save Jonah. He would have died without it. God sent a prophet named Jonah to save Nineveh. But God sent his one and only son to save you. He gave his best that your heart might be completely healed and that you have a home in heaven.